So there you were, or might have been. If you watched part one, I'll say one thing to you. Welcome back. On the other hand, if you just bought part two, I'll say welcome. Now, in this series, we've looked at uh, endangered species, which we're discussing in this particular tape. And in part one, which you should immediately rush out and buy, we discuss the common species and what one can do with that particular group. Now, it's important to realize that some endangered species are now bred so prolifically in captivity by aviculturists that in fact it is justifiable to put these birds into almost a pet situation. However, with other species it's very important that they're only put into situations where they can be bred and prolificate so that we can keep numbers up to maintain the species for future generations. But right now what we'll do is we'll go and have a look at all these species we're so excited about talking about and they've all been filmed here at Laura Park in Tenerife. So Phil's going to let me go now because the bar's open and you can watch the movie. See you later. In spite of its current listing status, this 11-inch bird was legally imported into the UK and the USA in great numbers during the mid-80s. Rapid depletion of wild stock no doubt caused local concern, leading to its eventual classification as rare and or endangered. However, in captivity, the Tuckerman has bred with enthusiasm in vast numbers and makes a highly viable pet alternative to the African grey. Though formerly an expensive bird, today prices are extremely reasonable. Wild distribution, southeastern Bolivia and northern Argentina. Number of eggs two, incubation 24 days. Since this is the rarest Amazon in the world, with only perhaps 20 or so remaining in the wild and 50 or so in a captive breeding project, the question of its suitability as a pet or aviary bird is not an issue. Once again, however, this 12-inch parrot is a species which probably only continues to inhabit our planet due to the work of dedicated conservationists and aviculturists. Eggs, two to three, incubation, 26 days, and its wild distribution, Puerto Rico, West Indies. It is most unlikely that this 10-inch bird will be encountered either in private collections or in zoos. Though a few do exist within aviculture, these are mainly single birds, most of considerable age. Its plain colour has probably contributed to its lack of availability, since trappers on its native island of Jamaica see little financial value in harvesting such a specimen in spite of the premium afforded it by collectors. It has been captively bred in the USA, where a limited number of pairs are held in aviaries, but it is unlikely to ever be freely available. Number of eggs, two to three, incubation, 24 to 25 days. A close relative of the Tuckerman, this bird may be seen in a number of collections open to the public, and certainly exists in a number of private collections both in the UK and the USA. They are endangered in the wild due to habitat destruction and harvesting for food. It is unlikely to be offered as a pet, but would probably do well in such a situation. Distribution, southeastern Brazil and northeastern Argentina. Number of eggs, two to three, with incubation, 24 days. Though endangered, this species is holding its own within its natural range with perhaps as many as three to 5,000 specimens existing. Availability outside of Brazil, where it is held by a considerable number of aviculturists, is virtually nil, 
but still it has found its way into a number of European collections. Its suitability as a pet is not a question, nor should it be. Distribution, southeastern Brazil, but limited to southeastern Sao Paulo to Rio Grande do Sul. Number of eggs, probably two to three. Incubation, probably 26 days. Frequently harvested in its home range as pets, this is hardly a situation likely to occur elsewhere. The blue cheek is a much sought after and highly desirable Amazon for all keepers of the genus. Legal imports of this bird to the UK were possible until the late 80s, when a ban on its export was imposed. A bird dealer suspected of drug smuggling was arrested at Heathrow. A search of his shipment by customs proved negative, but on a lighter note, the man was seen to carry a stuffed blue-cheeked Amazon throughout the entire ordeal. What may or may not have been inside the parrot, we will never know, and customs failed to inquire. Blue cheeks are held by a good number of aviculturists and, though cannot be said to be established, its continued existence would seem to be assured in captivity at least. While distribution, Guyanas, southeastern Venezuela and central eastern Brazil. Number of eggs 2 to 3, incubation 27 to 28 days. When is an Amazon not an Amazon? Possibly in the case of the yellow-faced, where study of chromosome analysis cast doubts on its inclusion within the genus. Still, while we wait for God to cast his vote, we'll assume that an Amazon it is. It certainly looks like one to me. It is not unavailable, but certainly rare in collections generally. Most birds coming onto the market in the UK having been domestically bred or shipped in from mainland Europe. Like several other small species of Amazon, this 10-inch bird can be extremely stroppy to their mates and require close observation within the breeder unit. Probably not an ideal pet, but due to temperament and its relatively high price, not a consideration. Distribution in the wild, eastern and central Brazil, number of eggs, two, perhaps three, incubation, 24 days. This 13-inch bird is extremely rare in captivity and it is kept and bred in very few collections worldwide. A great pity, since it is freely available in Brazilian street markets, where its asking price is less than will be asked here for a Patagonian conure. Some exports ought to be permitted, if only to bring new blood to current captive bread stock. Sadly, legally at least, this will probably never be the case. The red top Amazon is found in eastern Brazil from Agolas south to Rio de Janeiro, its main problem being loss of habitat. Number of eggs, usually reported to be four, incubation 27 days. For the true Amazon connoisseur, this is surely a bird without which no collection can be complete. Its compact size of 12 inches, strong personality and rarity make it one of my own favourite members of the entire group. My own birds came from that first gentleman of parrot breeders, Ramon Nogel of Florida. I never quite got over the excitement of their arrival from his facility and still less the pain of parting with them shortly after the third massive robbery from my premises in 1993. In spite of my own love affair with Barbadensis, it has to be said, that they can and do display serious aggression towards their mate, even when brought up as juveniles in the same rearing facility. Nor can they be recommended as a pet species, though in truth, their seriously high price will in normal circumstances eliminate such an event. Still, as Avery subjects, they are in general fabulous. Given the correct conditions, ideally, in my experience, kept away and out of sight of other Amazons in a collection, they will breed readily in captivity. Natural habitat for the Barbadensis Amazon is the Venezuelan coast and nearby offshore islands. Eggs normally three, with incubation taking 26 days. Strange to say, this 12-inch parrot was once sent by dealers to make up shortfalls in shipments of blue-fronted Amazons. 
not a situation likely to occur today, not least because of its considerably greater price in the marketplace. This bird is held by considerable numbers of collectors worldwide. It breeds readily in captivity and will make a willing and interesting pet. However, nowadays, this is an expensive bird. Coloration varies, especially on the underparts of the body. The brighter the specimen, the more desirable it will become. This differential is probably due to geographical origin rather than the definitive existence of separate colour morphs. Distribution in the wild, southeastern Brazil. Number of eggs, usually two to three, and incubation taking 26 days. If you want to see this parrot in real life, you have two reasonable options. Climb a tree on St Lucia in the Lesser Antilles, or visit Jersey Wildlife Park, where several specimens are held for captive breeding on behalf of the St Lucian government. Success on Jersey has been most encouraging, with young being reared most years since 1982. Probably only 300 survive in the wild. It is highly protected, and unless you are the Queen or the Aga Khan, you'll never own one. So look at this picture instead. Distribution is restricted to the island of St Lucia in the Lesser Antilles. I suspect, like most Amazon species, two to four eggs are possible but incubation in captivity is recorded at 27 days. As rare as the Pope at a rugby match, the 16-inch red-necked Amazon can be seen only at Vogel Park, Vals Road in Germany, perhaps only 300 survive in the wild, and legally at least, it is unlikely ever to be available within aviculture generally. Though attractive, it is not overall a colourful bird, and some specimens lack the red in the neck. Some serious funding is needed to save this bird from extinction, perhaps something the Parrot Society UK might like to consider from its vast, unused stash of cash. Wild distribution, the island of Dominica in the Caribbean. Eggs laid and incubation periods are unknown at this present time. Though probably no more than four to five hundred still exist in the wild, great efforts have been made by concerned and responsible aviculturists to increase numbers in captivity. This is a truly stunning bird to behold, and few could deny its natural beauty. Two colour morphs exist, one green and the other orange-brown. It can be seen on public display at a number of collections, notably Jersey Wildlife Trust, Paradise Park in Cornwall, Lorry Park in Tenerife, and Vogel Park, Viles Road, West Germany. All of these establishments have captive breeding programs. Swell distribution is St Vincent Islands in the Caribbean. Incubation of its eggs, 28 days. In spite of its relative rarity, this 11-inch Amazon is yet to be listed on Appendix 1. A reasonable number of these birds were imported into the UK in the early 80s with questionable origins and it is from these that the present day Avery stocks exist. At first its muted coloration raised little enthusiasm from collectors and the price of a single specimen was as low as £40. That situation however soon changed and today its value has soared. It has bred well in collections and can be considered established in aviculture, though increasingly threatened in its natural habitat of Jamaica. It is a charming and delightful bird, both as a pet and aviary bird. Number of eggs, two to three, incubation, 24 to 25 days. A colorful and much desired bird among collectors with a correspondingly high price tag. Nowadays, Aviculture has ensured its long-term survival. Five subspecies are generally listed, varying in size from 11 to 13 inches and coloration, mainly on the amount of red in the throat. These include the Isle of Pines Amazon, the Grand Cayman Amazon, the Cayman Brack Amazon, and the Bahamas Amazon. The nominate race breeds readily in captivity. The subspecies are said, however, to be less enthusiastic. Though the Cuban will make a good pet bird, 
this is not a desirable use to which such a species should be put. Generally, only captive bred birds are available, but wild caught birds still find their way onto the market from time to time. Distribution, Bahamas and Cuba. Number of eggs, two to three. Incubation, 24 to 25 days. And this applies to all groups. The largest of all Amazon parrots at 18 inches, it is without doubt also the most visually stunning and majestic. One of my most memorable parrot moments was coming face to face with a tame specimen at Vowles Road in 1978 where three birds were then held. Probably less than 100 individuals now survive in the wild, although there are unquestionably a few in very private hands. Wild distribution, island of Dominica in the Caribbean Lesser Antilles. Avery design suitable for the housing and breeding of Amazon parrots varies tremendously. Personal preference, finance and available space being just a few determining factors. In addition, climate and noise will be other factors in selecting the chosen structure and its location. Throughout a long career as a parrot breeder, my own preference was for suspended flights of wood and wire in an outdoor situation and later all wire flights within buildings. The outdoor flights, of course, required shelters, wind breaks, and, as with all flights of whatever type, privacy dividers. The ability to hear but not see the bird in the next unit being of particular importance during the breeding season. Generally speaking, the most successful Amazon breeding facilities in the UK have been on the indoor system within custom-built units. Provided with sloped concrete floors, a deep gully around the edges for power washing away, discarded food and faces, and a sprinkler system to replace natural rain. In such units, it is essential also to provide adequate ventilation by way of an air filtration unit. However, this must be of the HEPA type, that is, high efficiency particulate air filtration. An alternative is the installation of an air cleaner that works by producing negative ions and ozone such as the Mountain Breeze 2000. This compact unit cleans and revitalizes stale and polluted air, wipes out dust pollen and other airborne irritants, kills bacteria and fungal spores, and will effectively treat an area within a 20-foot radius. Of course, here in Laura Park, the Amazons can enjoy life absolutely to the full, whether they're housed in these traditional large aviaries you see here, or in the off-exhibit breeding unit. And of course, all the birds will need by way of protection in a situation like this is a little screening from the midday sun. So do we all. As with design, the size of Avery allows for endless possibilities. But my own preference is for six foot by four foot by four foot hung all wire flights suspended four foot from the floor, allowing the birds to perch above the keeper's normal eye level, thus providing a feeling of security. The use of 3 by one 12 gauge galvanised mesh allows for soiled food and droppings to fall to the floor, out of the reach of the birds. Any adhering is quickly power washed away. A door, approximately 24 inches by 9 inches, is necessary at both ends of such flights to facilitate the insertion and easy replacement of perches or catching up of occupants. However, in an outdoor situation, use 16 gauge half by half as this will prevent intrusion by wild birds and vermin. I have incidentally also provided the larger and more aggressive species of Amazon, such as the double yellowhead, with flights 12 feet long, allowing the hen greater mobility when Big Boy has an off day. Water is an essential nutrient of your bird's life, and this should be supplied on a daily basis in immaculately clean bowls. Not as we've seen in some facility where plastic pipe tapes, takes the water from one aviary to the next, carrying with it any problems that one aviary has into the next and so on and so forth. This is the best system. It is a swing feeder and will provide your birds with immaculately clean bowls which can be changed on a rotating system. We have the water here and we have the food in the top. Available, as I say, from quite a number of manufacturers these days 
It's the thing to do and what you should be using. The stainless steel bowls can be changed on a regular basis with no chance of a bird escaping. The DIY alternative seen here in the shape of a suspended wire basket is a cheaper but no less effective alternative. Note the access is cut in the floor smaller than the bowl itself, thereby preventing the birds from overturning the vessels and dumping the contents out of reach on the floor below. Nowadays, most serious breeders buy these ready-made, since the cost of raw materials often exceeds the price paid to a commercial manufacturer. For most medium to large species, a size of 12 inches by 12 inches by 24 inches deep will be adequate. The box is hung on the outside of suspended indoor flights, but inside the shelter for outdoor setups. They need only four to five inches of clean pine shavings as nest material. Do, however, secure wooden blocks to the inside, as these provide the birds with essential chewing material. And if you do decide to make your own, remember to include a good-sized viewing hatch at the back and use at least three-quarter inch block board or better still, good quality ply in the construction. So, we have an aviary, we have a nest box and presumably some birds, in which case they'll need something to perch on. Natural, fresh perches daily is the ideal and pine, apple, pear, cherry and willow the perfect choice. Other safe woods being oak, ash and chestnut. Of course, not everyone has access to a handy forest and stealing from your neighbour's fruit tree will hardly make you popular. So, two by one untreated sawn softwood from a timber yard near you will provide a safe alternative. Never, under any circumstances, use PVC or metal pipe. It's cruel and can damage your bird's feet, without which they will almost certainly fall over. Whether employed on an indoor or outdoor setup, lighting can influence breeding patterns. Certainly, extending daylight by artificial means, as winter in the UK gives forth to early spring, appears to stimulate breeding activity and beneficially extends the period over which a bird will eat. Generally, lighting is extended to a full 12-hour period commencing in mid-November and reverting to follow natural daylight patterns by September. Custom-built units which have been designed to provide all available natural daylight to the birds within can simply be equipped with normal domestic fluorescent tubes, but where a roof of solid construction is in place, special full-spectrum tubes must be used. Birds need rain to maintain feather condition. It also stimulates breeding activity in many species because in the natural habitat, after the rains, the food grows and provides for parent and offspring alike. So the installation of a sprinkler system within an indoor setup offers a number of advantages. I even install them on my outdoor flights for use during the two weeks or so of summer we get here in the UK early mornings and mid-afternoon being preferred times. Don't leave that last shower too late as the weather cools. Your birds need to dry off before night falls. Droppings will also be softened by the falling spray, making daily power washing an easier task. I have long held the belief that a fresh and natural diet should, as with humans, be provided for Amazons. In the dark ages of parrot keeping, a basically seed diet was provided, often of poor or questionable quality. This is a situation that prevailed well into the 1970s, and I regret to say, is still today practiced by old time keepers. However, as interest in Amazon breeding gained momentum, inquiring minds sought the diet of the birds in the wild and combined with information provided by poultry breeders and literature related to value of vitamins, minerals and food combining 
a new and revolutionary diet was formulated. At first, mistakes were made. Beans and pulses boiled and fed as a mash. Often, this was left to soil and spoil. Dishes not meticulously washed grew dangerous bacteria. The results were catastrophic. Even custard was proffered as a hand-rearing diet by one eminent breeder. The joke fell flat and a lot of nestlings died as a result. Pelleted food came into being, but was mostly poorly researched in construction, uninteresting in colour and shape, and the producing companies came and went, much like the corner loan shark. Imported American product went much the same way, with irregular delivery and frequent lack of availability. I myself fell foul of the warped sense of humour possessed by a particular individual who delighted in handing out crucially incorrect dietary information. Fortunately, both I and most of my collection survived this cruel scenario. By the mid-80s, it was realised that whilst beneficial, beans and legines need only be soaked, rinsed and sprouted to create an ideal base for an Amazon diet, no boiling necessary, which in any event had eliminated many nutrients. Observation and laboratory analyses now provided a well-balanced, though labour-intensive to prepare, visually stimulating food source bursting with living enzymes for captive Amazons. Now let's look at the components of that diet live in the studio. So now let's look at the components of my diet. Well, first of all, we'll, we'll concentrate on the seed uh, part of that. And what that consists of uh, is hull sunflower, as we can see here, some uh, safflower, which we can see here, some uh, peanuts, as we've got there, mixed millets, and also some pine kernels, to which we'll also add uh, some flake maize. Now, that's the basic component of the seed diet. And what we actually do with that is we put one part of the sunflower, two parts of the safflower, a half a part of the peanuts. There we are, half a part of peanuts. Uh, we'll take a half part of these pine uh, kernels, which birds particularly like, and we'll take half a part of uh, mixed millets. That's about half a part, I think. Marvellous. And we'll take uh, uh, a half a part of the flake maize. And we'll put that all in there like that. I'll just give that a little jiggle around, like so. And there we have, basically, the seed diet suitable for Amazon parrots. We can, of course, add a couple, two or three pieces of uh, primate diet, well known as called monkey chow. We can pop that on the top as well. And that's a perfect diet for an Amazon parrot. Now, what in fact we do is we use that to feed the birds in the morning, and then in the afternoon we use something completely different altogether. It is, of course, possible to mix the two components together, and we'll do that a little bit further along. Now, as far as uh, the bean diet is concerned, which is quite important for Amazon parrots, we'll use some soya beans, some aduki beans, uh, we'll use some black-eyed peas, and we'll, we'll use some chickpeas. Uh, and various other types of beans, not red beans, of course, because they, they are, in fact, poisonous. We mix all those together, and we end up with a mix like you can see there. Now, what we do with that is we take this and we soak it overnight. Once it's been soaked overnight, and something very useful to use for that is this old sweet jar here, which I've skillfully drilled in the top. So not only do I get something to soak my beans in, but I also end up with a, an all-in-one colander as well. And what we do is we soak that. The next day, we thoroughly rinse it. And then uh, it's put into a, a warm cupboard in the dark on its side like that, where these beans will actually uh, sprout nicely and create what's known as a living enzyme. Uh, but before we actually feed this to the birds, what we actually will do is we take the lid off of this and we'll add Milton sterilizing fluid to those beans, just uh, like so, one cupful of that into there, plenty of water, leave that for 15 minutes. 
after the 15 minutes, rinse that very, very thoroughly indeed, and then uh, we'll drain, you know, we'll drain the whole thing off, and those beans will be ready for the birds to eat. Let's just put those in there like that. And uh, in a moment, we might even get a bit of a close-up on there, and you'll see that these have all sprouted these little white bits on the end. Once that actually happens, uh, as I say, that living enzyme has been created, and that's quite important. That's lovely fresh food. You could eat that yourself if you put a bit of salad dressing on it. Now, the skillful thing here is that if you're a bit pushed for time, you shouldn't uh, try not to be too pushed for time when you're feeding your parrots, but not everybody's got half a dozen keepers and all the time in the world. We can mix this particular bean diet uh, that we've got here with the seed diet that we prepared earlier. And mixing that together, that will actually give you what's called a wet and dry mixture. And that's the ideal thing to enable you to add uh, um, minerals and vitamins in powder form like that. That will adhere to that rather nicely. Rather than just trying to put it on the seed, it obviously falls off the seed and the parrots don't get a lot of it. Um, obviously it works very well with the, with, the, with the bean diet that's obviously quite wet, but that will give you a very nice wet and dry mixture and a perfect type of situation for your bird. Now, the other thing is that parrots uh, do like variety. They're highly intelligent and it's very, very important to keep them mentally stimulated as well as physically active. And for that reason, uh, on alternate days, I will take fruit um, such as banana, an apple, and uh, some uh, of these things, very nice grapes. I'll also add to that some raw, uncooked beetroot. And that will give me that sort of mixture here. You can also use uh, cauliflower greens, not the cauliflower, but the cauliflower greens, very nutritious, very, very uh, full of iron, very nice for your birds. Chop it all up into this sort of cocktail, and again, you can mix that in with your seed mixture as an alternative to the beans on alternative days. So basically, there you are. There are some interesting diets for parrots. I'll make a final point. Today, when we're hand-rearing baby birds, um, unlike in the Dark Ages, where we had to take lots of components like this, um, it was necessary to uh, make up your own mixture. This is not true today. There are lots of very good formula on the market. This is a particularly good one, and you simply take this. It, it comes in a powdered form. I've obviously opened the one that's actually got the, got the lid on it, but um, if I can... Uh, Bear with, bear with me just for a second. There we are, just a powder. And all you actually do with that is to pop that in to there, like so. Add some water, which I've got skillfully hidden away under here. There we are. Give it a little twiddle round. Of course, you'd have used warm water for that. And uh, you will end up with a nice sort of custody type mixture. And uh, that will, there we are. Look at that, very good. Do you want some? No. I don't think so. Just a couple of seconds there. That will uh, go into your syringe. And it couldn't be simpler. I won't sample that. I have done before, but I won't do that today. OK, let's dispose of that. Now, finally, I'd like to make reference, from my own point of view, for the complete um, uh, total diet. In the past, some of these diets were made uh, mainly along the lines of dog or cat food as convenience foods. They weren't particularly good, and their supply was very unreliable. Now, we have the advantage that the companies producing these diets have not set out to make a convenience food. They have, uh, they have really tested their diets on parrots. The research has been extensive. It's gone over a period of 10 or 15 years. And now what we're left with is a totally nutritionally balanced diet. Now, obviously, um, originally they were very boring. But this is no longer the case, because if we look at something like this, you can see they're coming in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. They have different smells. They have different textures to the tongue of the parrot. And it's very exciting. And, it, and certainly in Florida and a great deal of uh, America, this diet, as a total life support system has become very, very successful. We don't all want to feed our birds this type of thing because I guess you and I wouldn't like to live on biscuits every day of our lives uh, either. But the truth is it will sustain your parrots. They'll breed very well on it. They'll, they'll rear 
healthy and vigorous young. It's a proven scientific fact this works. However, you can, as we've done in the past, mix this with your seed diet, especially as a, a method of, of weaning them off of the seeds, which can be too fatty, not so good for the birds, and you can end up um, with them totally eating this food. You can also use this food and add 20% of your fruit and vegetables for, you know, for variety to, as I said before, mentally stimulate the birds, and it also makes you, the keeper, feel, feel better. The other advantage of this food, because it's produced by such a professional company, is that they do produce, with it, free of charge, this wonderful, wonderful leaflet. And believe me, I've read it, and it's very comprehensive, very interesting. And yes, I've tried it, and it's quite nice. So there you are, uh, a number of different options, all satisfactory for the keeping, breeding, and rearing of Amazon parrots. So, their natural diet or the new pelleted formulae. Clearly, both will work to produce a satisfactory end result. But progress cannot be denied, and it is a fact that even as I speak, and I do speak, more and more advanced collections are taking up the pelleted options with outstanding reproductive results. Naturally, Laurel Park has its own secret formulae Revealed here on film for the first time by me in discussion with Laura Park's curator, Roger Sweeney. Roger, tell me about this diet. What have we got here exactly? What about this dish to start with? Well, basically we have two feeding periods each day. Um, we start in the morning where the, the basic food dish we give is a mixed fruit and vegetable salad. Um, that's comprised from most of the fruits and vegetables we can get locally on the islands. Many are well known, such as apple, pear, uh, we use beetroot, banana, orange. Um, also in terms of green food, we use alfalfa and also some shredded lettuce. Um, and also some of the local fruits that we have access to in the park and here on the islands, things like the fruits from some of the cactus that we grow in the grounds, uh, prickly pear cactus, um, also, it's not in this dish at the moment because we restrict it in the non-breeding season to stop the birds getting overweight, but we also do collect and use a lot of the palm fruits right. from the various types of palm tree we have in the grounds. With this particular fruit combination, would you add any um, you know, vitamin supplements to that? Daily, um, each of the two feeds that the birds get, both the morning feed and the afternoon, we do add a general multivitamin and mineral powder, which right. is generally sprinkled over food once it's prepared. Um, in addition to that, when the birds are breeding, we do give a little bit of extra calcium. Um, we give, uh, when birds are laying eggs and also rearing chicks, they get extra calcium in the water. And in addition, as I'll come on to in a minute, as well as the main food dish, we also provide the birds with a second food dish, which has a commercial dietary pellet. Right. Um, which is obviously very well balanced, mineralized, and we do actually produce our own supplement cake, which we give to the birds throughout the year. That, that looks wonderful, that doesn't it? Try right, a piece. Could have, uh, <laughs> later, later. Right, um, let's just, just come back onto this a second. So they're, they're going to get this fruit mixture in the mornings. Yes. So sort of what time do you feed the birds um, generally? The main food preparation takes place at about six o'clock in the morning, and by about seven o'clock, most of the birds um, or being given their first food of the day. Right, so and is this, is this particular mixture constant throughout the year? It varies, it varies um, a little bit even from day to day on availability right. um, of certain food items. I say as well as the, the main basis of the diet, uh, which are uh, various fruits and vegetables which are quite well known, um, also uh, quite a large part of it is some of the fruits that we actually harvest here in the gardens. Right. And those vary seasonally. Now, once, uh, okay, the morning's over, they've eaten all this, presumably. Is this bowl taken away? This, this soft food is basically removed, removed in the early part of the afternoon. And then in the afternoon, it's we get replaced on to this one. by the main afternoon diet. Again, this is fairly typical of a lot of diets that you'll see in, in European agriculture. Right. You have a mixture here of various seeds, sunflower seeds, safflower seed, hemp, millets, canary seeds. Um, also, you have some cooked beans, soya beans, mung beans, uh, black eye beans. Um, in terms of nuts, we use uh, pine nuts, peanuts, 
and a few things um, mixed in as well. Also at various times of the year when we're in fruit we do add again in the afternoon some extra palm fruits which we harvest from the palm trees here. Okay, now I noticed this which apart from this cake which we'll talk about in a minute, that looks wonderful, we've got this and you, you, you talk about this as being a <coughs> supplementary. Yes, um, obviously as you know nowadays there are quite a lot of commercial um, complete diets on the market yes. which are improving and a lot of them now are very good. Um, fundamentally we believe here in giving the birds at least two feeds a day and different feeds. They get a lot of enjoyment out of eating food. And the, we do use a commercial dietary pellet, but only as part of the feed. This is available in the morning and also in the afternoon. So they do have access to the commercial pellet throughout the day. But it is very much part of the right. overall diet instead of a complete diet. What percentage of the diet, generally speaking, as an overview, would, would these um, su supplementary pellets Some, something, take? Something around 20 to 30 percent. 20 to 30 percent. Most of the Amazons particularly do take to eating the food um, fairly well, but in most cases it's secondary to the fruits and the seeds. Okay, now there's lots of people around the world that are generally now moving on to a pelleted food and feeding it as a sole source. Um, you're not doing that. <coughs> you're, you're sh are you sharing my opinion that it is, it's important to give these birds some interest I, over and above just what they're having to sustain yeah, life? In terms of a dietary point of view, a lot of the new diets now are very good nutritionally, um, but there's only one po uh, component. You also have to think of a behavioural point of view, mm -hmm. and in when you're preparing and spending a lot of time preparing a mixed fruits and uh, vegetable salad in the morning right. and seeds in the afternoon, the birds are getting a lot of enjoyment from it. Also here in Laurel Park, we have about 3,000 parrots. Right. And <laughs> it's important that we give the birds as much behavioural stimulation as possible. Right. Looking after this quantity of parrots is a tremendous task to provide fresh wood, fresh perching, um, occupational things for the birds to do. If, if you have um, a small number of parrots at home, you can give them a lot more individual time sure. into giving them toys to play with and whatever. When we're working with this quantity um, of parrots, something we're quite aware of is the need to give them as much um, enjoyment and stimulus from the food supply, um, as well as um, obviously we do provide... Um, it's, it's nice to know we share the same sort of opinion, because obviously when you're when you're here at Laura Park, it's like meeting with the Pope, you know, this is the, uh, the second Pope. Tell me, now this is <coughs> looking fascinating. It does look good enough to eat. Go on, what, What's it, what's it? Oh. Okay, this is a cake. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I've been, she's been starving me all morning, my cameraman. Now I've got something to eat. What actually is this cake? Okay. Why this cake? <coughs> this is a cake we make every day here at the park. Um, basically it's made up... Um, it's, it's not made, bad, it's got a bit of meat in it, isn't it? Yes. Uh, basically, um, the main flour is made up of about four parts normal flour to one part soya flour. Right. To that we do add grated carrot, we do add um, a certain amount of cooked beef, um, egg goes in there, water, um, a little bit of baking flour to, to be able to bake it, and also some calcium and some natural salts as well. Um, the reason we formulated this here at the park was first of all about two years ago we made a decision to go back to trying to produce as many parrots as possible by parent rearing. Right. Um, one of the main principles in terms of parent rearing is the necessity to have food available to the birds from first thing in the morning to the evening. Right. Um, with the Amazons they can have three or four chicks sometimes. On some of the smaller birds here like the Perua they can commonly have up to seven chicks in a nest box. So when in a collection like this with a large number of birds of obviously a lot of work to do. Sure. Um, we were looking for ways to work with a diet where we can you know, produce um, items like this, which we can get in first thing in the morning. It's quite and, good, And um, it works very well as a supplement. Also, it's, once the birds get used to feeding on this particular food, it allows us to do a lot of things in terms of altering the vitamins we're giving to the birds, giving them extra calcium. All of this can be incorporated into the daily cooking of the cake and it gives us um, a very sort of variable form that we can supplement the bird's food with. And obviously, it's, it's a perfect food as well when you, you have to feed a lot of birds very early in the morning and you need to get the food in there so they can be feeding their chicks. And this, this will remain stable for a long period of time, <coughs> it won't spoil? Um, we, it's always made fresh. We make it fresh every day and we do keep some refrigerated in the morning to feed in the afternoon. Um, also, 
as part of routine in our food preparation kitchen, we sample daily everything. And we, this is sampled every morning. Um, By you? You, pers you personally sample this? No, one of the vets. It's, it's I, I would join you, but I've eaten already. <laughs> it's not bad, actually, I must say. You save, save me having lunch. That's ra rather, rather interesting, that. Very good indeed. So there we are, the secrets of the Loro Park diet. Hmm, very good. This will make me tame and talking. Thank you very much, Roger. You're welcome. Parrots of all species can and will rear their own young with varying degrees of success in a captive situation. Some pairs make good and reliable parents from day one, whilst others prove less than perfect in this area. There are many reasons for this. Inexperience, jealousies, leading to mutilation and or death on the part of one or even both adults, imperfection of the hatched chick, nest desertion through disturbance by vermin or strangers, invited or otherwise, or simply unexplained lack of interest. We can solve all of these problems by taking the egg or eggs or hatched chicks for artificial incubation and hand rearing. Taking of the eggs eight days after the full clutch has been laid is the ideal. At this stage, the egg will have set and the growth process begun. Uh, this miracle may be clearly observed by the use of a candler. After which the egg, eggs, are placed in a suitable incubator till two days before hatch when they are removed to a hatcher. Shortly thereafter, pipping will or should commence. Once the chick or chicks have successfully negotiated this procedure, it or they will be transferred to a brooder where it will, in between feeds, remain till feathered and placed in the weaning cage. Chicks taken from the natural nest will, of course, go straight into a brooder. Nowadays, there are numerous commercial producers of all the necessary equipment, and in the past, we have found success with products of several companies, notably Curfew. Here, in Loro Park, various equipment is in use. So, let's ask the curator a few pertinent questions related to the process of hand-rearing Amazon parrots. First of all, Roger, uh, equipment. Now, there's all sorts of different types of equipment. Mm. I can see you've got a particular type here. Mm. What is this sort of equipment and why have you chosen this? Can you? Basically, we have two main types of equipment here, which are actual incubators for the eggs. Right. And then we have, once the chicks hatch, we have brooders to rear the chicks in. Um, in both cases, the, the choice of equipment uh, decided on several factors. Um, obviously, price is one, availability, particularly living here on Tenerife in an island. Um, ease of maintenance, ease of cleaning, visibility. There are several factors. Um, when we come first to the incubators, um, there are several uh, brands which are available on the market, all of which are quite good. Um, at the moment here we use a mixture of English and German mm -hmm. incubators. Um, they all have their good and bad points, but most of them at the end of the day work out about equal. Right. Um, we'll have a look at one of the types of incubators we use here in a minute. Um, again, the nice things are it has very good visibility, it's very easy to clean, um, and the most important feature is obviously it holds a very constant temperature and it also holds a good level of air humidity that's controllable. Right, but obviously if equipment's being used here, uh, it says it, it speaks volumes for the equipment really, doesn't it? Oh yes, certainly <laughs> Certainly, the brands we use here we're very happy with. Right. And you know, we wouldn't use them unless they worked extremely well. Okay, well we'll look, we'll look at those in, in a second. Um, Roger, at, at what stage do you take eggs away for incubation? Um, we're here at Laurel Park because of a policy we have now aimed towards parent rearing. We only take eggs away with, if we have to. Um, you know, if we check the nest box and the eggs are cold, if there's any damage, if there's a behavioural or medical problem with one of the parent birds, that means we have to remove that bird from the aviary or disturb the situation. Um, in general terms, though, um, for most people, incubating eggs artificially, um, if they can wait till about 14 days of incubation, between 14 to 17 days, generally gives the best survivorship of eggs removed from the parents 
and put into an incubator. If, if, if that's the case, I mean, what's happening to the egg during that period of time that makes that an ideal time to take the egg? Um, the problem is the second best choice is to remove the egg right at the beginning. And then it is a little bit more difficult, but what that allows you to do is monitor the egg throughout its entire development right. and try and change the incubator husbandry to adjust any problems that might arise. When you start to take eggs at about anywhere between in the first two weeks after the incubation had already begun with the parents, one of the problems is it's a very sensitive time in the development and when you get that egg into an incubator you don't have any previous information on how much weight it's lost or exactly how old the embryo is. So when you first look at it and try and estimate, you're working on estimated information. Right. right. Uh, after about 14 days, the embryo is normally quite strong and well developed. Um, it's quite well spread within the available albumin space and it's, it gives you a much higher level of uh, survivability. Okay. In the event that you do take an egg away, um, do, do you clean the eggs or treat them in any way before you put them into an incubator? Yes, there are several products available now. Um, we actually use an English product here, uh, which is available from veterinary sources in England and also, I believe, elsewhere in Europe. Um, we clean the egg um, very lightly. We just put some of this liquid agent onto a piece of cotton wool mm -hmm. and basically wipe down the exterior and actually gently remove any foreign bodies or dirt that is actually on the outside of the egg. Most eggs are actually quite resistant to bacteria, right. but one of the problems is, particularly when you have an incubator running for a long period of time at a very steady warm temperature and also with humidity inside, it's a perfect medium for incubating bacteria as well as eggs. Right. So it's also important to clean the incubators and disinfect them routinely, sure. but also when you have a large number of different eggs coming from different nest boxes, it's a nice, it's a wise precaution to actually just clean the exterior very lightly with a, a suitable disinfectant. What temperature would the incubator be running at? About 37.4 degrees Celsius. And the hum what about the humidity? Um, we measure humidity here on the wet bulb and we actually measure it in Fahrenheit to confuse, save <laughs> confusion against the centigrade. So about right. 80, 81 to 84. In the majority of eggs where you don't have a past history of monitoring the, the weight loss of the egg, where you're getting an egg with no you know, previous idea or information on what's happened to it. Right. Um, most of the incubation period from the beginning through to the time when the egg's preparing to hatch is done at 37.4 degrees and a humidity of about 81 to 84 degrees Fahrenheit on the wet bulb thermometer is generally pretty safe until the egg's been in the incubator for several days and you've had a chance to monitor it and see if you need to vary the humidity at all. How often do you check the eggs? I mean, you take them out and candle them, I presume. Um, you can. Um, the two main ways of monitoring the egg, you can candle the egg, which is focusing uh, an illuminated light source into the egg so that you can see the state of the embryo development. Right. And also, obviously, you can weigh the egg to see at what rate it's, it's losing weight by moisture um, evaporating from the egg. Um, again, you can do those. It has to be at constant time periods. It can be either 24 hours or it can be 48 hours. And it doesn't really matter which. In, for most people who are only doing dealing with a small number of eggs, 84 hours is quite adequate. At what period would you actually see signs of life, you know, once you put the egg in the incubator? Um, generally you'll see the first signs of embryo development. You should be seeing something by about five days into incubation. Mm -hmm. um, again, in the early stages you're basically just looking at um, a fertile dot with a red circle around it. Right. And then obviously within the next four to five days that will develop into quite a, a visible embryo developing. Do you uh, turn eggs manually at all? Yes, in most cases um, we do use the turning equipment that's supplied in the incubator. For parrot eggs we find rollers are the best of the different turning devices which you find in most incubators. Um, but in addition to that I've always hand turned eggs as well. Uh, somewhere between five to seven times a day um, I generally turn eggs by hand, particularly if you're incubating from fresh and the eggs in early incubation. Why, why is it important to manually turn these eggs? It has, it has several effects on the egg, particularly in the early stages where the developing embryo is quite mobile within the egg. Rotating the egg allows the, the embryo to circulate in the albumin, picking up different nutrients and also uh, necessary gases. Uh, in the later stages, it's also necessary to help for the even development of the egg. As the veins are spreading out into the albumin space, it, it's necessary to keep that even. So, 
Just to uh, make that totally clear, how many times in a day would, would the automatic turner turn the egg? And how many about, times would you do it? It varies on different machines. About Normally, most um, automated turning devices will turn about 12 times a day. And I generally turn by hand um, five to seven times a day. Depending on the egg, I turn a little bit more often if it's an egg that's taken fresh and we're doing the whole of the incubation artificially. Right. And if, if you have an embryo that is developing abnormally or very slowly, you can increase some turning as well, which can have a positive effect. Okay. All right. Um, are there any particular points regarding hand rearing uh, that you personally like to, uh, you know, give to our viewers? Um, there's only two points really. The first of all is the, you know, the importance of involving an avian vet at an early stage. Um, an awful lot of parrots that are hand reared now can be very prone to just picking up quite simple bacterial problems, which can have quite a dramatic effect on the bird, um, you know, even stunting its growth when if it's diagnosed early um, it can be treated very successfully and with no harmful effects to the bird. It's important that you find an avian vet almost before you begin hand rearing and familiarise them with what you're doing and yes. the species you're working with. And the second point particularly here at Laurel Park is particularly in the last two years we've spent an awful lot of effort trying to increase the amount of birds we parent rear. Um, particularly in Amazon parrots there are advantages to having hand reared parrots as pets Certainly when that bird goes into a new home, hand-reared birds have much more of an open personality and you know, there is a reason to hand-rear some of the common species. Particularly in the rare species now, um, I would like to see more parent rearing being done. Uh, there are several joint breeding programs being carried out in Europe now. Uh, here at Laurel Park we do a breeding program for the Amazona rhodocrypha, mm -hmm. the red round Amazon. And there is certainly a need on a lot of these birds for a higher percentage of the birds being produced to be parent reared. So in balance. <laughs> in a balance, a balance between the two. Yeah. So there we are. Well, thanks very much, Roger. That was You're very welcome. interesting. Whenever possible, locate your incubator and brooders in an even temperatured room, away from the day-to-day -day activity of the household. Resist the temptation for coach tours. Your ego may temporarily benefit, but chances are your offspring won't. Under no circumstances take in eggs or hatchlings from other facilities. The risks outweigh any short-term monetary advantages. Of course, incubation is a vast subject, and although we have looked at the basic principles, further in-depth study may be best achieved by the acquisition of the following books, Practical Incubation by Rob Harvey and Parrot Incubation Procedures by Rick Jordan. For within these two excellent books may be had the life's work of two of the world's leading authorities on the subject. Good luck and happy reading. Obviously, it's impossible to cover every subject in a film such as this in depth, in particular nutrition, veterinary care and incubation, all of which would require individual programs of at least two hours duration. So until we can find enlightened sponsors to make them, I recommend the following books. For all pet care and veterinary aspects, how to Care for Your Pet Bird by Dr. Joel Murphy. The reason this book is so good is that it was written by a man with an amazing brain for those of us who don't. Murphy is not only one of the world's leading avian veterinarians, but also heads up a major parrot breeding research centre. The information he imparts is clear and simply delivered enabling even simple people like me to grasp the subject at hand and in spite of its title aimed at achieving the widest possible sales uh, this book is essential reading for pet owner and breeder alike yes you sir or madam may have discovered God I on the other hand have found Dr Joel Murphy and suggest you follow my example so now let's go live to the studio 
for some publication news. Well, believe it or not, this section is not about wine, although I can't resist mentioning it since my director's just said that this is where the wine will come up because it always does. And in this case it does because this comes from Laura Park. It's quite wonderful. I shall have a little drink of that. Mm. Very good. Don't want to let my fan club down anyway. When I came into aviculture, uh, oh, some 20 years ago, there were very few publications and certainly very few periodicals available for people interested in the subject of the family citadel, uh, which for you out there, madam and sir, means uh, the family of parrots, uh, members of which, of course, are Amazons. Now, today we're quite lucky, although this is one of the, one of the publications that's been around for years and years and years and years, everybody should read this. And as it happens, on the, I've skillfully selected this issue because um, here we've got a nice orange wing Amazon on the front there. That's nice, isn't it? But in the back, the main reason for having this is in the back of here, we'll find all the, the classified advertising. And that's where, generally speaking, you'll find odd birds to pair up when you're getting ready to start up as a breeder. This comes out weekly, and you should subscribe to it immediately in case I've written an article in it that week. Right, that's enough of that. Now, also, today, we're lucky enough to have these two wonderful magazines here, Just Parrots and Parrot Magazine. Confusing, really, isn't it? Anyway, they're both marvelous, and this particular one here, Parrot Magazine, is edited by a wonderful lady called Vanessa, and uh, Vanessa is a leading member of the Parrot Society. The nice thing about that is that she's not, not just got a job as a, a magazine editor, she actually has hands-on experience and in-depth knowledge on parrots. So when she's editing the articles, she really knows whether the contributors know what they're talking about. I also write for this one, so obviously you'll immediately want to go out and subscribe to that. That is a quarterly magazine at the moment, unfortunately, but with luck it will become more frequent as time goes by. Right, closely following uh, that one is Just Parrots, another excellent magazine, and extraordinarily enough, also produced by this time a man, um, I think he's a man, he looks like a man to me, um, who also keeps and breeds parrots, so again he knows what his subject is. So we really are very well catered for uh, in the 1990s with all these lovely uh, magazines specifically aimed at parrots and specifically put together, compiled, edited and so forth by parrot experts. Okay, now then, obviously, uh, we mustn't overlook this magazine here. On the front here, <coughs> we see the very unusual Amazon. This is the yellow-faced Amazon. It's the bird that they, they say may not be an Amazon after all, uh, after they'd uh, carried, carried out something called uh, chromosome analysis. It may, in fact, belong to a different group of birds altogether. We'll see. As I've said in my um, little editorial for this Amazon in the program, it looks like an Amazon to me, so that's fine. Anyway, back to Bird Keeper. Bird Keeper's monthly. Once again, I write for this as well. It is a lovely magazine. It covers mainly parrots, but also there's 20% of other birds as well. And if you like Amazon parrots and birds, then I'm sure, in general, you'll enjoy reading that magazine. Uh, down to your local news agent, or you can get it by subscription. End of commercial. Right. Now, naturally enough, bird keeping, uh, breeding Amazons, and so forth is a worldwide uh, interest, is a worldwide interest. And naturally enough, we can look at Australia, where they have a magazine amazingly called Australian Bird Keeper. Isn't that ex exceptional? This is a very, very nice magazine. And the interesting thing about subscribing to this particular publication is that it covers not just Australia, but Australasia. And if you want to know where Australasia is, you'll have to go out and buy a map. But it's all the little islands as well. It goes across to New Zealand and so forth. So that is really well worth getting hold of. It gives you the views and uh, opinions of aviculturists in far-off lands. You could even get a pen friend or two, or a parrot friend, something like that. Anyway. That's Australian Bird Keeper. End of the commercial for magazines. This one you definitely need. Uh, it's called Bird Breeder. It was called American Cage Bird, but being politically correct, we don't keep birds in cages anymore. Well, we do, but we're not, not supposed to. So they now call it Bird Breeder. It's full of articles, very well written, 
top veterinarians uh, write for it, top uh, American uh, aviculturists, some of the finest parrot breeders, and particularly Amazon breeders in the world, all contribute to this magazine. So it is well worth getting hold of. And you will find the details of this and all the other magazines and where to get them at the end of this film. So, finally, societies. Uh, naturally enough, Amazon's, like almost every other hobby, um, has its own society. It's been recently formed in this country. Tassuk. I thought that was an interesting name. Or Tassuk, or Tassuk, depending where you come from, really. What I found interesting about this small club magazine, which uh, has managed to um, afford itself a colour cover, is that the information in it is really interesting. Now, I've bred parrots for 20 years. I've bred 11 species or more of the Amazon family, and uh, I'm pretty much convinced, or was pretty much convinced at this point, that uh, I knew more or less as much as you know one needs to know. But having had a little read through here, I found lots of information that uh, hadn't come to my notice before. So it's, it's, it is well, well worthwhile joining the Amazonia Society, obviously particularly if Amazons are the thing that you love most in the parrot family. Now, we've all obviously enjoyed being at Laura Park, but how did it all begin? Who created this magical paradise for parrots here in the Canary Islands? Well, who better to ask than Mr. Wolfgang Kiesling, the park's director. So, Wolfgang, how did this all begin? Why Tenerife and why parrots? Well, let's start with your first question. How did it all begin? Right. I was working as an airline manager in Germany for one of these charter airlines, which was based, the financiation of that airline was based on tax reduction. And all of a sudden the laws changed and there was no cash flow anymore into the company and I had the feeling that this was not the best business I was in. Hey. So we flew with the airplanes always on the weekends down to the Canary Islands because people at that time, we are talking in the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, were buying little piece of lands here to buy them, themselves an apartment or to build a little bungalow. Right. So in these airplanes, I usually flew down here on Friday afternoon and I came back on Sunday to Germany. While I was here, I realized that there is very little to do a part of uh, the visit of Mount Teide or the visit of the island to see some churches. But there was needed some kind of an entertainment. So I said, well, what could I do? So I was dreaming of a safari land. Something with tigers and lions and elephants and animals. I always wanted to work together with animals. It was my dream to work with animals. Okay. Well, no, this didn't pay. There came only 500,000 visitors then to Tenerife. It was impossible to get any kind of, of benefit out of this. So I was sitting home in Cologne with my father and we were discussing this and he said, hey, why don't you try parrots? And just parrots, they live a hundred years and they eat a handful of corns. And that was actually the beginning of Laurel Park. So I realized that was a good idea. And I said, well, I will try to do this. I had seen Parrot Jungle in Miami. I knew Birdshow and so on, and I thought that was, that was what I should do. So, here's the answer to your question. It started like this. Well, that, that's very simplistic. I mean, to, to actually suddenly say, well, I'm going to start a, a parrot park, and then to have ended up with something like this. I mean, as, as yeah. a child, as a child, did yeah. you, were you interested in, in animals at all? I was always interested in animals. Yeah, did, so I did was, you keep I animals? Was, I, I was like everybody of us was. I always had something in my pocket, something running around with me. I was never without an animal in my life. Or a hamster or a monkey or uh, something. Um, or a little mouse or, or whatever it was. Right. I always had something <laughs> around me. 
So that was because I wanted to work with animals. I saw that in a different scale, but it didn't finance. So that was why I came down. Uh, why I came down to parrots. I mean down uh, in size. Right. Okay. Right. And uh, it was also needed less less land. Look, if you make a safari park, you need you need square miles to make it good. Sure. To make a parrot park, you needed less. So all this fitted into it. I had no money. I had little money, like every like every man with 35 years. <laughs> I didn't have more. So I said, well, with the money I have, let's see how far we come. I bought the first 13,000 square meters, like this we started, on a life rent uh, contract. I had to pay the people until they died. Um, and I borrowed some money here, some money from my father, some money from a friend of mine. And so I started up. Started up with maybe 200, 250 macaws, which I sent somebody to Brazil. Then, we are talking beginning of the 70s, right. there was no CITES documentation, there was nothing needed. And they brought me the 250, they came in uh, like then it was necessary with the documentation which was asked for. And like this we started up. Managing such a large collection, and also what must be an extremely demanding job, that of administering the running and development of the park itself must severely restrict the time you spend amongst the birds. Yet I know that you take a very personal interest in each pair. How do you manage that? I started up with 13,639 square meters. And today we have 125,000 here inside of the roads and if you go over the roads we have another 30 or 40,000 square meters. Right. So that has been constantly reinvesting the money which we which we made here and uh, naturally constantly working very hard. Uh, 12 hours a day is nothing and if I hear people that they are tired after eight hours I can't understand it. So. <laughs> Uh, I'm getting up very early in the morning. I'm out here at 8 o'clock already, already. And most of the time I come home without that I have a rest at lunchtime. I take maybe 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, I come home at uh, 9, 8.30, 9, 9.30 in the evening. So you really say you're, you're fanatical? You're yeah, fanatical? No, no, I like my work. I like my <laughs> job. So right. in this time, uh, in the beginning, I had naturally very much more time. The park was smaller, there were many less people working here, much less uh, preoccupation, and today this is an industry. I have to take care of everything. I'm the managing director. So if you want to be that, you have to know which machine is working, which machine is not working. How is the situation in the bird department? How is the situation with the gardeners? How is the publicity section? How is the sales department? How is the bookkeeping department? You have to be in all of that. So if you want to be in all of that, and if you want to be prepared for an interview like you are asking me right now, <laughs> you just need time. Right, I'm gonna ask you a question. We've already stated and we already know that this is the largest parrot collection in the world, certainly the most comprehensive parrot collection in the world. How many species are represented here at Laura Park? Uh, and how long has it taken to build? There's the two questions. <laughs> well, uh, as I tell you, I started up in 1972 and I'm still building. Right. So uh, that means uh, we, are still, we are still also growing in our pet collection because there are always coming up birds which are offered to us day by day uh, which we don't have in the collection. And I see actually uh, my collection as a museum for, for birds and a tremendous scientific uh, fountain. No, fountain is, is, is not the right word. It is uh, a pool, a pool of scientific uh, possibilities which our collection gives. You have seen me right now greeting Professor Kaleta who is sitting here, who comes every year with his students from Germany 
We have day by day uh, scientists from all over the world which are coming here. We give these big conventions every four years. You have seen that there are up to thousand people which have come here. Why do they come? Well, they want to see the birds alive. They don't want to see them just uh, tried out in some kind of a museum. Let me, let me lighten that up a bit. I mean, you've come here. I mean, obviously, you're, you're of, uh, if I might say, of, of German extraction. Now, I drive a Mercedes car, so do you. It's precision built. If you come here, you've got uh, a situation where you've got basically Spanish-type people which have a different attitude to life. Yeah, I think we can agree with that. So how, have uh, you, how have you kind of put those two things together? I, I will tell you something. Uh, with the people which work with me here, I'm very, very, very uh, happy with them. Right. Uh, they are very, very worksome. They are very uh, interested to learn. Yes. Uh, I, would, I would never say that this, what I have been doing here, would have been as easy in Germany to be done. What we've got here is an amazing parrot collection. Now, you've actually given these parrots away. Well, so you, what you've actually done is, you've built this huge parrot collection, and then you sort of give them away. And what I really want you to tell us is what you've done with those parrots, because you've given them to a sort of a foundation. Okay. Can you tell us about the foundation? That's important. OK, let's see how I can start and explain it uh, easily. When I built up this collection, that was in the time where the trans Brazilian highway was going to be constructed. Right. That was a time where really people didn't think so much about uh, wildlife protection and so on. At least me here in Tenerife, I didn't, I didn't really think very deeply in this. I bought a bird because I saw him, I liked him, I thought that was fantastic to have him. Right. Later on when I realized how important these birds are to nature, and maybe that they can be species which are the last ones on this globe. I started, first of all, to reinforce tremendously the uh, uh, scientific uh, part of my park. I brought in ornithologists like Rosemary Law, like Tony Silva, which had very, very big names, which were very well recognized. Yes. Uh, I started to get in contact with all the famous uh, bird breeders in the world. I got advice from them. Then I brought in veterinarians. I built up a tremendous big clinic. Today here in the park we have three veterinarians and we have one assistant to them. We have ornithologist, uh, that means the curator, which is a very known, well-known parrot specialist. And uh, that was my first step. Later on I said, well, we have such a big collection and these birds are breeding. Now that uh, we are in this breeding, I don't want to make money out of the birds. I have my park. The park has brought me enough success in life. I don't need that. <laughs> so I said, well, how can I help nature? I said, okay, all that my birds are producing, I would like to be used to help nature again. Right. So I started and I built up the Laurel Park Foundation. And as the first step of it, I gave all my collection in property to the foundation. And now we are trying uh, first of all, to secure the foundation. I give also money to the foundation. By example, I bought a big piece of land. They got now 27,000 square meters of land. And very soon the, the, the whole collection will move out of Laura Park and will be separated. So you don't personally uh, own the birds anymore? The foundation The is foundation owns the birds. Owns the birds. Uh, owns the birds, and then the birds go on from there. But you know, there's a law of foundations. So the foundation is an institution right. which you create uh, and in which you have, you, you can manage it, you can interfere in it. But yes. it's not anymore your property. You can't take any money out of it. Right. The money which belongs to the foundation belongs to it. But the foundation itself then goes on to do good work. Yes. 
And we are doing that. I don't know if you, if you haven't read our last news, <laughs> but in, uh, in, in the last uh, two or three years since we're working, we spend about $500,000 on, on, on projects in the world. And yeah, but that's the important thing, you see, because what I'm trying to say is that most people wouldn't understand what the foundation is. So we're trying to explain that. The foundation that. is today the owner of the parrot collection, right. which exactly. once was the, uh, the ownership of Laurel Park. Right. Now it is foundation. L and uh, by this, uh, we, have no, we have no possibility anymore to, uh, to sell birds or to keep birds or to have birds uh, and make money with it. The money is now to the foundation. And when the birds breed, and have youngsters, these youngsters belong to the foundation. Right. And we sell these birds and the money goes to the foundation. Right. So there, look, we have bred to the, this year over 650 birds. So I imagine you can uh, imagine that this is, this is money worth. And the, and the work, I mean, the money from the foundation goes to what? What exactly well, does that do? Because up particularly now, if up I till, can... Up till now, you said before, I have a lot of work. Yes. And so you imagine that I couldn't take care of everything. I try to take care of everything. And I'm not uh, a specialist either. Uh, I can't be a specialist in everything. I have to take care here of so many things that there are things I don't know I, and, 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 and I don't reach. Sure. So in the beginning, I said, whenever somebody asks money, I said, well, uh, you think it's worthwhile? I ask some friends, is it worthwhile? And when it was worthwhile, we gave the money to these uh, people which uh, were asking for it. We contributed quite a lot of money to bird life, to projects with bird life, uh, to rare center, uh, all these organizations. But we had the feeling lately that we can do more and that we can do better. And so we engaged Dr. David Volk. He is now in the foundation, the scientific uh, director and he is going to work out and to propose to us uh, what we are doing with the money we have in the foundation so, so well, I guess we got to a very good uh, we got to a point everything has to grow I started with 13,000 square meter <laughs> I started here with a veterinarian who came once a week and who didn't know anything about birds Today I have three specialists walking around here. So you feel basically, I mean basically speaking, you have made an amazing contribution to, to parrot conservation, basically. Well, I don't yes. know if, I, if, it's a, if it's a big contribution or not, but I feel I have done what I could. Yes, yes. Now one thing I want to ask you, because it's very important, and your dog's woofing, but one thing I want to ask you is about the, the Spix Macaw Recovery Program, because mm. everybody will be interested to know in that. Can you just tell me a little bit about that? Well, I would have liked you would have done this interview with, with me four or five days later, because I'm leaving tomorrow to Brazil, uh, just to meet the uh, Committee for Recovering of uh, this bird, and uh, I will find out what's going on. But I can tell you so far that it is uh, the Spix macaw is in such a bad situation that there is only one bird left in, in Liberty. So we have put another bird out in March and this bird did very fine with uh, the male, which was outside. Do, we, do, do you really believe, I mean, I, I'm, I'm under the impression that there's only one, one bird left in the wild I mean, is this really true? I mean, is this just, is this a wind up or what? I, I, I will tell true? you something. I will tell you the truth, what I think. I don't know. <laughs> but I tell you something else. I don't want to know. <laughs> right. if, if tomorrow, if tomorrow uh, we find out that uh, there are more species, fine. But that means from the day on we know it, that we would have to protect the animal as long as we don't know it. We don't have to protect it. You, you built this lov lovely parrot collection, but there must have been some funny times as well, some, you know, lighter moments to building all this up, because, you know, obviously it can't all be serious. Oh, life, and life is always full of jokes, I mean, and full yeah. of happiness. 
Let's have some jokes. Let's have some jokes. Well, I will tell you one thing. That is a very long time ago. When I came here and I brought in the first flamingos, uh, they arrived at the airport. And uh, the chief of, of uh, custom was not there. And then he came, and my flamingos, they were there in boxes. I knew they had done a very, very long flight. I was very worried about them to take them out of their boxes. And then he came and he said, well, before we can take them out, we need the official veterinarian. So I said, well, where is he? He should be working. He said, yes, he should be working, but he is not here. So you will have to wait until he comes back. So I waited for an hour, I waited for two hours. He left, he went for lunch, I was still waiting. The veterinarian didn't uh, uh, arrive. So I said, well, I can't leave my birds anymore in the box. <laughs> so I started behind, on the airport, behind his office. There were, was a little loan and I took the boxes out and I started to take all the flamingos and I put them on the lawn there. When he came back, he got almost a heart attack, I think. <laughs> but it happened. And then he said, well, the veterinarian is not coming today. I send him over to you. Take your birds and go home. <laughs> <laughs> With that man, I, was, uh, I got a very good friend in the past. He was a very difficult person in the beginning. But, uh, he liked me afterwards very much. So there you have it. Amazon parrots. Wolfgang Kiesling, who, after all, made this film possible, Laura Park, Tenerife, and me. Thank you for watching. Bye now.